Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, mentoring hour this morning. Uh, before we begin, can we just pause for a word of prayer? Can I ask one of our students to please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone would be willing to lead us in prayer? Father God, we bless you and thank you for this new morning you've given us. We thank you for what you have in store for us as we receive the teaching today. We pray that you'd open our hearts to receive it. We thank you for the facilitator this day. May you anoint her and bless her. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Juliana. Um, this morning, we have Jean George speaking to us on the topic uh, emotional healing. And after her talk, we'll open up the floor for any questions or uh, clarifications that you may have. Uh, please feel free to post your questions in the chat or unmute your microphones and ask directly. Uh, over to Jean uh, for her talk on emotional healing. Thank you, Pastor Selena. Good morning, everybody. Uh, trust that all of you all are doing well. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the topic of emotional healing for our mentoring hour. Um, I, you know, we, we do know and we uh, probably do understand that a lot of us uh, have gone through emotional wounds at some point of our lives. We've gone through maybe different kind of challenges, different situations that's caused us emotional hurts. So whether these uh, wounds have actually stemmed from circumstances that have been natural or maybe because of the actions of others or sometimes even it's actually brought about by uh, brought upon ourselves, um, we do face some kind of emotional struggles. So emotional healing is something that all of us need to some extent, extent because we have all experienced uh, these wounds. Um, so to start with, I think just I'd like to just uh, bring about a quick overview and then we will go quickly into some aspects of um, uh, how do emotional problems come about uh, and how, how do we heal. It is a big topic in itself, but I've just picked out some important points. Some of this list is not exhaustive. It's uh, I've, I've just picked up that which is uh, important. So to start off with, uh, as human beings, we are all um, tripartite beings. We are um, uh, we are made of a body, we're made of a soul as well as a spirit. And uh, we, this is referenced at 1 Thessalonians 5.23, maybe a verse that's quite, quite uh, familiar to most of us. So the body is the outer frame. The soul is the mind, the will, the emotions, the intelligence. Uh, it also includes the way that we think and the way that we reason. And this is what we are going to be looking at in the area of healing. And yes, the spirit is the part that connects to God. So all these areas have a function and sickness or problems can enter any one or all of these. So the sickness of the soul can be emotional pain. It can be inner turmoil or inner hurts. Now, there can, be, uh, there can additionally be psychological issues or mental issues which need healing. So... Um, having understood that, let's move on to understand what really causes uh, emotional problems. As I said, this is, may not be an exhaustive list, but definitely can capture some of the most important ones. So emotional hurts can stem from various sources. Uh, one of the, uh, um, um, the more... Uh, uh, the more prominent ones that we do see are traumatic events or childhood or maybe some kind of family trauma that takes place that can cause uh, emotional hurts. So experiences such as abuse, it can be physical, emotional, sexual uh, abuse that could take place. It can be neglect. It can be tragic events that can um, leave emotional, deep emotional scars. 
there can be traumatic memories that can persist uh, which can influence the, the person's sense of safety or the person's self-worth or the even the ability to even be uh, able to trust other people another um area that we see or a source that we see is broken relationships. Broken relationships can, um, can come from loved ones such as family members, friends, partners, spouses. And when this happens, there's a deep sense of betrayal or rejection or abandonment that the individual may feel, which can cause deep emotional pain. Uh, often in many of these cases, unresolved conflict or loss can leave people feeling extremely wounded and disconnected. Uh, a third uh, source could be unmet expectations. Sometimes when life does not um, come about as unexpected, whether it be in one's career, in family, or their personal aspirations, it can result in feelings of uh, disappointment, frustration, or even sadness. The fourth area is continual sin. Um, sin can indeed, continual sin can, can lead to emotional and psychological dis distress because it creates that separation from God, that inner conflict, it creates guilt, it creates shame. Some of the examples that we can look at is um, when when there is when a person lives in continual dishonesty, continual lying, it can weigh heavily on their conscience and causing guilt and anxiety. Another example are of sexual sins like adultery, fornication, pornography that can damage not just relationships, but a personal sense of worth. It can lead to shame. It can lead to emotional uh, turmoil uh, or even harboring anger or hatred towards somebody can lead to that sense of extreme turmoil and dissatisfaction. So continual sin is something that we see can lead to emotional uh, distress. The fourth one is, uh, the fifth one is addictions. Addictions like uh, substance abuse or, or any other addictions which can lead to emotional bondage and struggles. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 lists some works of the flesh like drunkenness, envy, strife, and warns against those who practice that. Uh, another source is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness uh, towards somebody as a result of probably some experience, some trauma uh, uh, that is generated and the resentment that comes as a result of that, it can take away from one's emotional sense of well-being uh, and, and steal away that sense of joy or that peace. Uh, the seventh uh, one that, that I put here is self-inflicted uh, negative uh, confessions. Now, what are those? Those are uh, sometimes statements that we make that may reflect harmful beliefs or words that's, uh, that we speak over ourselves. Uh, and these can definitely have a detrimental effect on our emotional as well as our spiritual well-being. Now, these negative uh, confessions prevent us as individuals from walking in the freedom and the promises that God has offered us. So these negative uh, confessions not only affect how we feel and think, but it can also shape our behavior and as a result it can shape our uh, our reality or what is actually happening in our reality so uh, now i'm just going to get into what are some of the steps to emotionally heal as i said this is not an exhaustive list but specifically taken in the area of emotions and how we can lead uh, uh, work with emotional healing so before we get into understanding this, um, we need to know that emotional healing is a journey. It is a process. It can take time. Um, and, and so you know, even as, even as I'm listing all of this, uh, it's something that we continue to engage in and continue to uh, journey through so that we do experience the healing that is promised to us. So the first and foremost is, yes, prayer. Prayer is a um, very powerful step in emotional healing. Um, James 5.13 says, is anyone among you suffering? Now, this suffering can be any kind, whether it be physical, emotional, it's any form of suffering. And someone who's gone through that kind of an emotional struggle really can understand how 
damaging or, or how uh, intense uh, it can be. So it, it, James says, let him pray. So what does prayer do? It connects uh, us directly with God, allowing us to pour out our hearts, to really seek him for that comfort and trust in the power of healing that he gives us. So when we pray, in times of that emotional uh, pain, what do we do? We, you can openly express your pain. You know, sharing out your burden with God can bring about a whole lot of emotional relief. And I'm sure all of us have experienced it. Just taking that time to really being genuine and open, honest with God, and really casting out all our cares um, before Him helps us to have that relief because we know that he, he cares for us, he is there for us. So just expressing our pain. When we look through the um, all of the Psalms, we see of how the Psalmist pours out his heart without any kind of a limit, just really shares and um, uh, brings out the intensity of what, what he's feeling. So expressing our pain. What does prayer also do? Through our prayer, we're also in, in those moments of confusion or that deep hurt, God provides us clarity and even gives us direction through our prayer. He, we, are, we are able to seek that wisdom and guidance from maybe what we can do or how we can deal with that, uh, that sense of emotional pain that we may be going through. Through prayer, also we receive God's peace. <clears throat> we pray uh, when we pray it brings us uh, god's presence it invites god's presence and that's where we can find peace that um, that transcends every kind of understanding even in the midst of those emotional storms that we that we may be going through what is the next uh, way that we can actually bring about healing is following god now this is one of the most important steps towards emotional wholeness it is to it is to follow God. And, and uh, Psalm 23.3 says, He restores our soul. So God is absolutely interested, not just in the well-being of our spirit, but He is also interested in the well-being of our soul. He wants us to be well in our souls, just as in our spirit or, or in, our body, in our bodies. So as we continue to follow God, as we continue to build our intimate relationship with Him, he brings about that emotional wholeness. He brings about that restoration that we need. Every pain, every storm that comes about, he, he helps us through and he, he walks us along through that journey. So our intimate relationship with God really matters in our emotional wholeness to God. Often what happens is when we are emotionally not feeling well, we tend to move away from God. We tend to keep away, recluse ourselves from God. But this is exactly it. It's a time that we should pursue God because that's when we, we experience and see that emotional wholeness. The next part in emotional healing is to confess our sin to God. And we, we spoke about one of the causes of um, uh, emotional uh, problems is ongoing sin. So confession is needed for healing because that guilt that we may be feeling as well as any kind of negative emotions, whether it be resentment, anger, grief, shame, pride, all of that actually seeps into our spiritual health. And any kind of un unconfessed sin is a killer. It's like emotional cancer. And uh, uh, the scripture that we have is, is 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, when we confess our sins, God is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we begin to see that healing taking place as we confess our sin to God. Uh, God. The next is to be able to let go of our past. Um, here in this verse, specifically, I've just taken this verse, Paul teaches us that when we let go of all of our past mistakes and when we focus on the future and what is coming ahead, it is a key to emotional healing. Dwelling on our past failures can hinder us uh, uh, can hinder our growth forward, even our spiritual growth. Um, but we are able to move forward in faith and we, we experience that hope, we experience that purpose. So it is, as the verse says, we forget what is behind, what has gone on, what has trained us, 
and we move on. We press on towards the goal to win the prize of which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. So letting go of the past would also mean that we choose to forgive because God commands us to forgive. Um, in Colossians two, uh, verse 3, verse, uh, verse 12 to 13, it says, as the elect of God, bear with one another, forgiving one another. One of the examples we do see in the Bible is that of Joseph. You know, Joseph was uh, wronged by his brothers. They, he was sold into slavery. But instead of holding on to that bitterness and anger, anger he chose to forgive uh, his brothers. Um, so by letting go of the past and seeing God's purpose in our suffering, uh, we, are, we are able to experience that emotional, maybe even the relational healing, as well as probably also reconciliation that may come about. The, the next one that we look at, and, and a very important one, which again is not something new for us, it is renewing of the mind. And uh, what, is, what does this renewing of the mind mean? It involves transforming our thoughts, our attitudes, our perspectives, so we align with God's truth. So often the perceptions and the meaning we make uh, to, to some of our situations uh, in our lives will become like operating beliefs um, that we, we live by. And so we, we have a faulty sense of thought patterns that we live by. And that's exactly what the renewing of the mind is. It is the, the process is, this process is very important for our emotional healing because our thoughts will influence our feelings and thereby it influences our behavior. And as a result, it influences our overall well being. So when we change the way we think, we begin to uh, heal emotionally and experience the peace and the freedom that, that God can give us. And, and this verse is very familiar to each one of us. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do we renew our minds? And, and, I, just, and I think this is so important for us to understand what do we do practically? How do we renew our minds? Um, so I've just put in four points over here, where the first one is to guard our gates. So what is this gates? So many of the thoughts that we uh, produce are a battle in our minds. And it, it can actually be prevented by simply guarding the access points to our minds. Um, and what are these access points? These access points are what we look at, or what we hear, or even how we react to our feelings. So guarding the gates to our mind is, is a way to really be careful about what we engage in, what we listen to, and maybe how we, uh, how, how we feel. Philippines 4 8 says, how do we guard our, our, our hearts and the reactions to our feelings? It says, Philippines 4 8 says, um, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, think of such things. It says, what is worthy of praise? Think of such things. So that's how we guard our minds. When when we do that, we will reduce the ability of the of the enemy to actually sow wrong thoughts into our mind. What's the next step? It is taking every thought captive. Again, a very familiar verse that we destroy every argument, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge God knowledge of God and take every thought captive. So in order to take a hold of a thought, we need to make it obedient to Christ's authority. So how do we do that? First and foremost is to filter out those thoughts. How do we filter the, those thoughts? When we work together with the Holy Spirit in us and our knowledge of the word, it equips us to deal with whatever wrong thought. So each thought is taken captive and it is filtered. So ask yourselves this: the, ask yourselves these questions. Does, the, does this thought agree with God's word? Does this thought grieve or, um, uh, or, or does, it, does it make the Holy Spirit, uh, does, does it uh, grieve the Holy Spirit? Uh, then, you know, we need to handle this accordingly. An easy way to remember how to use the thought filter is by using these three words, the three R's. Recognize. Recognize the source of these thoughts by aligning it up in accordance to the knowledge of God's word. Second is refuse it. If you know that the thought is unwholesome, refuse to dwell on it. 
actively put that thought out of your mind, refuse to conform to it. And third is to replace. Replace that negative thought, that negative impure thought with God's word. So look into scripture, dwell into scripture to find out how we can replace, dispute that thought with God's word. So, the, so renewing your mind is one of the most important ways of how we can emotionally heal. The next one, again, this is very, very, uh, this is something that we learn so much is to establish our identity in Christ. Our emotional pain stems from identifying with the different things. Maybe it's with our past failures, with our mistakes, or maybe even labels that people have put on us. But the Bible teaches us that the true identity is found in Christ. So renewing our minds involves embracing the fact that you and I are a new creation in Christ. We are loved, we're forgiven, we're made whole. So this truth is something that can, can heal those emotional wounds. The, the next one is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power and the work of the Holy Spirit is what brings um, uh, healing to our inner person. The anointing is what breaks the yoke. It breaks the bondages. It removes burdens. So the anointing of God uh, brings healing to our souls, removes that spirit of heaviness. It brings comfort. It brings joy. Uh, um, instead of the mourning, it heals that broken heart. So the, so the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit is another um, way that we, we are emotionally healed. The next one is um, taking support, taking additional support. We do not need to journey through healing alone. We need to surround ourselves with people, godly people, with mentors, with counselors, with pastors who will support us, pray for us, and speak the truth into our lives. Now, taking additional support also could mean, at certain times, seeking the help of, um, of a medical practice or seeking the help of counseling. And there is nothing wrong in doing so. These measures are only additional measures that can help you to offer strength and support. Nevertheless, we do what we need to do um, uh, for ourselves to come into that place of emotional healing. So as, as, as we come to the close, it's just for us to know that emotional healing is a journey, but it can offer hope and restoration. So no matter what the depth of our wounds may be, there is a way forward and when we can turn to God because the love of God is unconditional. His peace surpasses every understanding. His promise of restoration is definitely certain. So when we trust God, when we uh, let go of our past hurts, when we uh, embrace the truth of the word of God, we can find healing in our, in our deepest emotional, emotional pains. So remember, healing takes time, but with God's presence, God's word and support that you can get, we can come to a place of hope and of restoration. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean, for sharing those insights on uh, emotional healing. It was very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, we now open the floor for any questions or clarifications that you may have about what Jean has just shared. Additionally, if you have any questions related to the course lectures or about life and ministry, uh, please feel free to ask those as well. You can post your questions uh, in the chat section. Uh, or you can unmute your microphones and ask directly and our faculty are here. We'll do our best to help and assist you with uh, answers. So over to you all to ask your questions um, related to what Jean has spoken, any clarifications, doubts you have, please feel free to ask. Yes, Naveen Jos, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Okay. While we wait for um, uh, him to ask his question, we'll uh, have a question here from Carl Ebenezer. Uh, oh, he just, okay, he just thanks Gene uh, for uh, that excellent session. Thank you. Naveen, you had a question? I 
I think Jean's session was so good that all of us got emotionally healed. <laughs> so we have no questions and doubts. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chanti has a question. He says, in relation to forgiving, uh, okay, uh, on forgiving, is it okay? But we have... Okay, when we forgive, uh, you're saying that, you know, when you have, uh, when you forgive people who have hurt you, uh, uh, you know, you still have some guilt about the past that you hold on to. Is that what you're asking? Chanti? Okay. So maybe you've forgiven people, uh, but uh, you still have some guilt. How do you deal with that guilt about the past? Okay. Um, yes. So, uh, when so, so even as we're looking at forgiveness, um, especially when someone has caused us emotional hurt, um, we do follow the command that God's given us. So, forgiveness is a command, and we are called to forgive. How, although forgiveness can be very difficult, it's not something that we do out of our own strength. But we do, uh, but we have the power of God to help us through that. So forgive, forgiveness is not just a command, it's a decision that you make. It's a decision that we make to obey God and as a result um, come to a place of forgiveness or, or extending that forgiveness. So it's, uh, it's, it's a choice that we also make to, to forgive. Now, even when we have forgiven, I think maybe by the word that you, uh, you've you written as uh, guilt, I think you also probably do mean a sense of memory or that you still do recall some of the things that have happened. The pain probably is still, is still there. Yes, that is true. The pain could be there. But as you continue to release uh, to God the pain and the hurt, and that's why we need to... to come to God for that healing, that healing of the pain or this the struggle that we have gone through. We come to God for that because it's only He who can actually help restore that place of pain and hurt that we may be experiencing. So uh, it's a choice that we make, but we believe that as we continue to uh, follow through the command of God, God, is, God will restore us. So when, when we take on what God's word says, we can be sure that God will extend his restoration and his healing to us. And in time, he will be able, we will be able to heal from that space of resentment, <clears throat> anger, or guilt that we may be going through. Because, and, and it's, it's a conscious uh, decision that we make that when, when we have when we have forgiven or when God has forgiven us, God has released us because in God's word, everything to do with forgiveness, God says, I, I have removed your sin, right? Or, or I have removed it as far as the east is from the west. So if that's what he's doing for us, we can actually walk in freedom. And that means we renew our minds to know that, you know, when God is forgiven or when we've also extended forgiveness, that's what we've been called to do we've done our part. We've done our part, when, especially when we are uh, extending forgiveness to somebody else or when we've asked the Lord for forgiveness, we've, do we've done our part and God will, as he's promised, bring us to a place of restoration. Thank you, Jean. I hope that helped uh, Chanti. Uh, we will go to our next question from Maui. It says she asks, what about the presence of evil spirits, demonization? Can it cause emotional unwellness and how is it dealt with so yes thank you Maui for that question yes um, the presence of evil spirits can cause emotional emotional wellness um, so I, I, maybe I'll, I'll take a, a certain example um, maybe I may not completely uh, address this in fully and I'd, I'd leave it probably open to the other pastors also let's say at a at a at a point where a person is in sin, 
is in continual sin. They do leave uh, their hearts open for the presence of the evil spirit to come in. And that can cause a whole lot of emotional unwellness. Um, and, you know, you're, you're inviting maybe spirits um, into... Uh, into your your soul to operate and as a result of which there can be many things that the enemy continues to accuse you um, of of things that you have done so the first so i think it, when especially when it comes to evil spirits uh having done whatever we've spoken about the, it is necessary to be delivered it is necessary to come uh, to a place of deliverance where we, uh, and that's something, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a very extensive, loud thing, but just coming to a place of renouncing what the enemy has done in our lives or the, or the spirits that have, that have been, that we have left doors open, open to. So, it, so yes, one is deliverance. The second is also closing doors, closing probable open doors that allow the evil spirits to come in and the bible talks about that you know when 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 the room is clean uh, the, the spirit is looking and they they bring in seven more spirits to come in to invade so that's important to ensure that we leave every open door closed and continue to walk in that wholeness that that's there so when our rooms our homes are clean our hearts are clean we walk in the healing of uh, uh, in the presence of God. So continuing to speak and declare uh, the presence and the spirit of God over us. So it, it, if we look at it, there are it's done in many ways. One is keeping away from sin. So that is having that, uh, being able to have that sense of self-control to not move into areas of that habitual sin. The second is to have deliverance yes uh, to go through that place of deliverance and the and the third one is to um, uh, build ourselves in the identity of christ knowing that that we have been sanctified we are the righteousness of god uh, we are god's children we are god's people so that's how we continue to walk in in that place of emotional healing when we when it uh, when when it comes about with evil spirits i i leave it open to the other faculty if they'd like to also add in any points. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Any one of our faculty would like to help and answer this Maui's question? I think Jean has uh, presented most of it. Anything else? Okay, I hope that helped Maui. Uh, we'll move on to our next question um, from Jack and Joel. Is there a sign within ourselves that we can be assured of in Christ that we have come to this position of inner healing and wholeness? Um, I would think uh, it, it's it's a place of peace that we we are able to experience um, in in the internal part of our our beings, but. More than that, the evidence of it, so when we're looking at emotional health, we're also looking at the way that we um, manifest our emotions, how we regulate our emotions, what happens when we are triggered by certain events in our lives. And, uh, uh, and I think the, the evidence also to it is the way that we have managed a certain trigger point or a certain trigger event. Um, maybe let's say there are, uh, you know, you're reminded of something someone has told you and, and, you know, you've gone through your emotional healing and maybe you hear that again. Does it, uh, does it erupt the same kind of uh, uh, pain and hurt that goes through? What's the intensity of it? What's the period of it? I think the evidence also lies there to really uh, see how you have responded, how you have experienced, uh, maybe even the conversation of it, whether it creates that sense of pain and, and anger or, or hurt. So just knowing that how we have dealt with it and how we continue to engage with it in future is probably one of the signs. And yes, the peace that one would receive as a result of uh, having uh, experienced that healing. Um, emotional problems, uh, I, I didn't get into this because it, it's a whole lot of other, um, uh, you know, entire topic, but the symptoms of emotional uh, problems are uh, significant 
um, uh, um, you know, burden and overwhelm on the emotional realm, where people can can actually experience emotions, you know, almost like a physical symptom, right? At, you know, it, it's kind of like a choking uh, because of the intensity of emotions that come about. So, so I would I would think that you know, once someone is in that journey of emotional healing, the intensity of those emotions actually come down and actually die down. I hope that helps, Jackin. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Jacqueline, let us know if you have any further questions uh, regarding what you've asked or what Jean has, uh, how Jean has answered. Uh, we'll move on to our next question from Jeevan. Is it necessary to suffer in our life to begin ministry or to be strong in our faith? To, and do we, uh, do we have to go through tough times? Basically, I think uh, Jeevan is asking, do we have to go through tough times when we uh, you know, uh, when we begin ministry or when we are doing ministry, uh, and should we should we be strong in our faith? So, can I ask one of our faculty to answer this, please? Pastor Paul or Pastor Nancy, anyone can please answer Jeevan's uh, question. Uh, yes, Pastor Selena. Thank you, Jeevan, for this question. So um, uh, I would say that it is not necessary to suffer in our life to begin ministry. Uh, however, we do know Jesus mentioned, he said that uh, in this world we will have uh, trouble, we will have tribulation. So uh, just by virtue of the fact that we are here um, on the face of the earth, there will be challenges uh, even as we launch out into ministry. So as those struggles come, yes, we will need to face them um, uh, with God's uh, strength. Uh, however, you know, it, it is not necessary for one to, you know, suffer uh, in, in order to begin ministry. Uh, I hope that helps, and uh, I leave it open for others to add on. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Any of other faculty would like to share anything regarding this question? Okay, I hope that helped uh, Jeevan. Uh, we move on to our next question from uh, Chaya Paul. How can one deal with the continuous ongoing trauma and emotional hurts? Jean, can you please help answer that question? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chaya. Um, uh, I think first of all, I need to mention that someone who's going through ongoing trauma and a continuous emotional difficulty, um, it's a very, very painful situation. You know, it's, it's something that, uh, uh, especially in a situation that you're living through, it's something that never ends. You're, you're looking for that break and that doesn't happen. And uh, what, how, how does that impact a person is that it builds on. It's like it like piles up. The emotional pain actually piles up. And uh, this, I think, is a space, apart from all that we have spoken about right now, um, to, to really get... Uh, again, I think also this is dependent on the kind of trauma one may be going through. So if it is a trauma that uh, God is opening to you the wisdom and the discernment to step out of, that is something you know we must do. Like for example, let's say a person going through domestic violence, continuous physical abuse, domestic violence or, uh, alongside probably with sexual assaults, all of that is something uh, that the person must must have the discernment to to move out of to physically move out of that space till you can get the support and the help to restore um, a situation like that i think that's the first and foremost thing one needs to do um, it is it is harmful to continue sitting staying in a situation where you see that there is um, uh, there is trauma uh, to you in something which you can do, in which you can step out of. Once you're able, once you can step out of that, it is definitely needed to yes follow through all of the steps that I spoke about, as well as get the support and help of some of a, of a counselor, of a pastor to help you through that. Especially if you are in a situation where this trauma comes from 
maybe a loved one or, or someone uh, in, within the family, uh, it's important to be able to address it and to, to get that help so that uh, some of that can at least cease, uh, can come to a full stop. There may be some things that may not be <clears throat> you'll not be able to completely reconcile, but to bring yourself to a place of safety is something that's extremely important. Thank you, Jean. Uh, I hope that uh, helped Chaya Paul. Uh, we'll move on to the next question from Adrian. Um, she says, she just thanks Jean for the wonderful, uh, insightful session on emotional healing. And a uh, question is with regard to respecting that is uh, a deeply personal journey for other people. How do we help a brother or sister who we recognize is stuck in a pattern of sin and repentance? So, okay. yeah, so this, um, I, I think what you're referring to also is probably a, a, a very addictive pattern of a behavior where there is someone who who indulges in some sin, repents, and then goes back to the same sin. So it's become one of those habitual, continual sin that, that happens. And, and I'm sure that a lot of us engage with people like that who are in addictive patterns. Um, it's definitely important, uh, especially if you're a helper, if you're someone who's working with them, it is to help them in that journey. Because... Um, uh, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and I've seen this in our experience, a lot of us have seen this, that when the Holy Spirit touches, when he uh, he's there in, in their midst, the presence of God can actually bring people out of this addictive behavior in, in, a, in a split second. Not all people may experience that, and so it's a journey. It's something that someone needs to walk alongside with them. Uh, continuously working alongside with them, showing love, uh, showing that that sense of, um, you know, pushing them through, pushing them ahead into really uh, analyzing, evaluating where they are in their, in that, in the place that they are, and bringing them to a place of repentance. I think it, it's in it's in this space that support is is very very uh, needed and very important people in addictive behavior who engage on their own find it extremely difficult to move out but then when they have someone who's accountable they are accountable to it's it's a lot more helpful so if you are a, a, a person who's who's uh, working with somebody like that Keep going on, keep encouraging them in the word, keep encouraging them to repent, bring them to church, bring them to, uh, to a cell group so that they, you know, they are infused. They, they really have the word of God going over and over with them. And of course, um, um, uh, connecting with them in love because people who are in addictions feel extremely isolated, feel unloved. So just connecting back with them in love as well as, you know, placing the boundaries that you may need to. And uh, so these are some of the points of how we can help people like this. Thank you, Jean. That was very helpful. I hope that uh, help answered your question, Adrian. Uh, we'll move on to Rin's question. How would you comfort someone who has lost their loved one, spouse? Uh, what is the right thing to say and do for them to be emotionally healed? Okay. Um, thank you. Ren, uh, grief is, uh, is a very, very complex emotion. And uh, it, it is not something that could probably go away in time. I mean, grief is is when someone's lost someone to, to probably death or even, even any kind of a loss. Uh, it's an extremely intense and complex emotion. So your question is, how do you comfort someone? Comforting someone who's undergoing grief is being with them, is listening, is allowing them to grieve, allowing them to emotionally pour out. What is the right thing to say? I would say for the initial few times, don't say anything. The best thing is not to say anything. It's your presence and it's your prayer. It's your, uh, just just you being there is very, very uh, helpful for for people who may be going through, uh, go, uh, going through grief. Um, there is a time and a season to really express um, or to, to say the right things. I think even when we encourage them in the word, there is a right time to do that, especially when they are really broken, maybe right after the death of the person, 
uh, the best thing to do is just be there, just, you know, just hold them and just support them with things that they need, maybe that is uh, imminent for them uh, at the t right after the time. And in time, it is to encourage, encourage them, get into conversations with them, because they may have m multiple number of questions. And some of them maybe you don't have an answer to. And it's OK to say, you know, I don't have an answer to this. But then, you know, I just want to journey alongside with you. But then, I, you know, I just trust that that God will show us the answer. So just being there, supporting them through that, maybe just spending time in silence, doing what's imminent is is helpful for them to go through that journey. Generally, uh, uh, clinical evidence says grief can extend to up to three to six months. And it's OK for people to grieve that uh, for that for for that long. Maybe it's not as intense. But uh, three to six months is a time period that is actually a healthy space to grieve. People need to grieve. If they do not grieve, they're suppressing those difficult emotions that they may be going through. Thank you, uh, Jean. I hope that helped answer your question, Rin. We'll move on to uh, Jeevan's question. People often say God gave us and God takes away. Uh, is it God's plan to remove people from our life? Uh, would any of our faculty or Jean would like to answer this? Any of our faculty would help answering this question? Pastor Ashish, can you help, please? Um, yeah, I hope I'm on, I hope my audio is okay. Yes, Pastor. Uh, so, Jeevan, uh, yeah, so people often quote um, what Job said, and uh, uh, Job chapter 3. Uh, where Job, you know, just Job is just going through what he's going through, and he says, "God gave, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord." But uh, Job made that statement, but that doesn't mean that statement is true. Um, uh, we need to understand. I mean, there, there, there are lots of different things, but uh, let's say, on on one hand, uh, we recognize that um, we are responsible for our own actions. Right? The Bible teaches us Galatians chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Um, uh, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So if I am responsible for the law, so my actions or my decisions have brought about a certain loss, and in this particular case, we're talking about people being taken out of our lives uh, out of their actions, uh, we cannot ascribe that to God. So one is people's own actions could shorten their lives. And we cannot say God took them away. No, that person was responsible. If a person lives it is irresponsibly, not taking care of their health, etc., that's one situation. Second situation is we know the enemy is at work. Satan is also at work. The thief comes, John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So that's another factor. And so sometimes through sickness, through other means, the enemy causes uh, the loss of a life uh, at an early stage. A third factor would be the actions of other people, right? So there is war, there is killing, there is crime, uh, where people do evil to each other. And we cannot ascribe that to God. It's people doing it. And they could do it out of various reasons. Sometimes demonic influence is also there, but it could be anger, jealousy, war, crime, so on and so forth. So the point is that there are many factors which we cannot directly ascribe to God, which will cause the shortening of a person's life, meaning a person dies before, uh, li before living out the full length of life. The other thing we need to see is God's word. In God's word, he always tells us you know, that he wants us to live out the full length of our lives. He promises us a long life. So when you put all this together, uh, a quick answer to your question is, it is not God's will and God's plan or God's action that takes people away from our lives prematurely or at an early age. So that's uh, the conclusion we can come to. This is a short answer. I hope that helps. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, we have a last question from Deeksha, but since we're running out of time, we just have one minute. Um, I think we'll just close and we'll... Uh, 
Jean, if you could please answer Deeksha's question, we can post it in the main audi and it'll help everyone as well. I'll just uh, uh, have this question uh, ready for you. You can answer that. Um, thank you so much, Jean, for your uh, for sharing your insights on emotional healing and for answering all the questions. Thank you, everyone, for joining the mentoring hour uh, this morning. Have a blessed day. God bless you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>